and welcome to this um, very um, enthusiastic but small crowd. Uh, this is our city council meeting, but we, as you will notice, do not have very many city councilors here. We have three city councilors who are at the National League of Cities meeting this week and one city councilor who uh, had another commitment this evening and could not stay for this meeting. So because of that, we don't have a quorum, so I'm not gaveling in. And we will not vote on anything today, uh, but we are happy to hear everybody's thoughts and we will have our, have our usual proceedings. So we are going to open today. We are uh, pleased to have Candace Shorak here, who is our a representative of our sister city association with Jinju, uh, South Korea, and she has a report to offer from the students' recent trip. So please take it away. Hi there. Um, I had thought we would have two of our three students here, but the two who could come had things that came up at the last minute. So um, if you will pretend um, that I am a high school senior girl with very long black hair, um, <laughs> this is Isabella's report. It is hard to put into words how much this experience impacted me. In all honesty, I never expected to be accepted into this program since I live in Corvallis. I certainly was not expecting to return to America, feeling as if I was leaving my family instead of returning to them. No matter what I expected to gain from this trip, my experiences exceeded those expectations, and I am incredibly grateful for such an enriching opportunity. The two other American students and I encountered some difficulties early on in our trip. However, our excitement and willingness to work together got us through the mishap and we found ourselves even more grateful to be on our way to Incheon. One of the many benefits of this program is how it connected me to individuals in my own country who share my interest in culture and adventure. The three of us bonded immediately and still keep in contact. When we finally arrived in Korea, I was amazed by the natural beauty of the country. We were welcomed by Mr. Ha, who promptly fed us and made us feel comfortable after our long flight. Throughout the entire trip, Mr. Ha showed us nothing but kindness. He taught us many things. I'm so thankful we had someone like him to guide us and translate for us. He showed us around Seoul first, and while I was not used to the population density, I found myself loving the bustling life of the city. We visited places such as Myeongdong, Namsung Seoul Tower, Gyeongbokgung Palace, and Lotte World. Despite my fatigue from the flight, I was filled with excitement. I was wide awake to experience the joys of South Korea's capital city. We had a lot of fun touring Seoul, but we were anxious to meet our host families and explore our sister city with them. From the moment we were in Jinju and I met our host families, I knew that I would never feel uncomfortable. They were all incredibly polite and eager to show me everything that they could about Jinju. Even on the first night with Solhua's family, I adjusted well. I never worried or had many problems despite the language barrier. The first week with Solhua's family introduced me to the hospitality and kindness of Korean families. Getting to know her and her family in our free time was just as much fun as our planned schedule. I'm so lucky to have Seoul Hua as a friend. We contact each other almost every day and talk about the differences between our daily life in different countries. Switching from Seoul Hua's family to Jin Hyo's family was bittersweet, but Jin Hyo and her family welcomed me with so much love and warmth that I easily adjusted to the transition. There were many new experiences in a new home, but what stayed the same was their eagerness to help me in any way possible. They made sure to always cater to my needs, buying food that I liked and taking me places I wanted to see. I'm grateful to both of my host families for always making me feel comfortable. I learned many new things about the culture of Korea through this experience. There were many differences from the U.S., but I loved learning about them. Things such as sitting on the floor to eat, extended school hours, and formally greeting and bowing to almost everyone were new but exciting experiences. 
Despite these differences, I felt honored to be taught about their culture and accepted as a part of their family. We made many fun memories in Korea that I will cherish forever. Through activities such as the temple stay, karaoke, and simply spending free time with each other, we bonded and easily became friends. We, the Eugene students, were sad to leave Korea, even though we were taking our friends with us, and we were eager to show them our homes in America. It was entertaining to see how amazed the Korean students were. I never thought there was anything special about my home, but my host sisters made me feel like I lived in a palace. They adjusted well, and they faced every challenge with a positive attitude. Our time in Eugene with the Jinju students flew by too fast. I felt happy that I was able to return the kindness they had shown to me in Korea. We found comfort in each other's company during all of our activities. I loved shopping and taking tours with them, teaching them about our lifestyle. On the day they had to leave, I felt like I was saying goodbye to part of my family. The Jinju students and the times we spent together are so precious to me. I hope to see them again soon. I consider myself incredibly lucky to have been a part of this program. I have learned so many things, made unforgettable memories, and gained loving friends. I will forever be thankful for this amazing opportunity. Wonderful. Now I'll read from Jessri. Uh, we sent uh, three, excuse me, two girls and one boy. And uh, Joaquin is a student at A3 in Springfield, although he lives in Eugene. And Jessri, if you'll imagine now, I'm a high school senior girl with a kind of a Afro-like hair and a little ponytail. <laughs> Since the moment I found out about the Eugene Jinju Sister City program, I knew that it was going to be an incredible experience. But what I did not completely expect was for it to be a life-changing trip. I know that may sound a bit like an exaggeration, but being able to travel to a foreign country and to be lucky enough for that country to be South Korea, a place I had been wanting to visit for a few years, it's the truth for me, and I know the two other Eugene students feel the same way. I never anticipated that I would come across an opportunity to be a representative of the city of Eugene in another country much less alongside two other lovely individuals who were complete strangers to me. The thought alone of traveling thousands of miles away from home with two kids I barely knew was scary, but I quickly learned to appreciate Joaquin and Isabella as individuals. We got along really well, and even if it was difficult to communicate at times, I still appreciate them very much. I learned a lot of important things during this trip. The importance of family, of culture, of respect, and responsibility. But there's one thing that has stuck with me even until now that I didn't think would because of my lack of confidence and ever-growing communication skills. And that is having two lovely families and eight amazing friends. I'm someone who struggled a lot with making friends and socializing, and this trip was a really unique and amazing way for me to come out of my shell and learn that it's okay to be comfortable and have fun. I hope that even many years from now, I am still talking to John Ju and her family, and Tai Min and his family, and the rest of the Korean students. They really are like family, and my days in Korea will be forever cherished. We learned so many things about South Korea and how they got to be such the great nation they are today. We learned about the history of the people and their home. We got to be in the middle of bustling streets and people who were so different from ourselves and yet similar in many ways. Jinju felt like another home. I think we learned from our families, the friendships and the bonds we created are probably the greatest things we did while in South Korea. We became family with people who didn't know us and that we hadn't known before. Not even just when we Eugene students were in Korea, but while they were here in America. Visiting South Korea changed my life. I know that sounds cliche, but it changed my perspective on friendships and family, and it emphasized the importance of molding different cultures together as well as community. I hope to have the opportunity to put these improved skills of communication, building relationships and connections, and my new perspective to use in the future. 
Thank you so much for sharing those letters with us. That is really lovely and wonderful voices that they shared and experiences. So and thank you. They appreciate the city for that opportunity. Excellent. It was great to be able to have that relationship with, with the city of Jinju and those students. So thank you. Okay. Now we are ready for the public forum. <clears throat> The public forum is an opportunity for individuals to speak to the city council on any city related issues except for those items which have already been heard by a hearings official or are on tonight's agenda as a public hearing. Each person will have three minutes to speak. When you come to the podium, please give your name, city of residence, and for Eugene residents, your ward if known. The timer and lights indicate the time you have to speak. The red light indicates the end of three minutes. And we have just 15 speakers. Yes, just 15 speakers. So the first one is Ralph McDonald, followed by Natalie Marks. Good evening, Mayor and Councilors. Um, I'm Ralph McDonald, and uh, tonight I'll be speaking wearing two hats. I'm a resident of Ward 2, Betty Taylor's Ward, and I'm a member of the Housing Committee of the Sustainability Commission. And I want to thank the Council for the work you've been doing on affordable housing in Eugene, specifically in responding to legislation of uh, Bill 1051 and try, uh, looking at ADUs. The uh, Sustainability Commission has passed a resolution, and it's in your packet, so I'm not going to be able to read the whole thing, but I wanted to point out a couple of highlights. Uh, one, part of it says uh, we direct, we ask you to direct staff to prepare quick, easy, and effective code modifications that would allow places of worship to provide on their own property transitional housing, including accessory dwelling units, ADUs, and cottages for homeless families. Uh, we've had the, the churches in our uh, Sustainability Commission a, a couple of times at least, and they uh, have had good cooperation from the city, but there are uh, r these strange roadblocks that have, have prevented them from being able to deal and add housing uh, to places of worship. Uh, two, the Sustainability Commission submitted a letter to the City Council uh, in October 2017 on tiny houses, and we'd like you to consider tiny houses as well as you're looking at the housing situation. Three, in supporting curb modifications to increase the supply of housing, the Sustainability Commission acknowledges that neighborhoods change over time. While facilitating needed changes, the city should also sustain and support those characteristics that residents consider most essential to their neighborhood's livability, i.e. trees, natural features, historic and architectural character, etc. Now I'm going to change hats quickly. And um, as co-chair of Sh uh, Sheena, we've submitted a letter to the council on uh, the, the uh, pest and wildlife problem. and. Uh, uh, I want to thank the council for taking up this issue. We've had residents that have been infested by rats and have other wildlife issues, so it's an important issue. But uh, it's also an issue of ecology and the relationship between species. For example, in our area, uh, just north, just south of the fan area where they've had a big rat problem, and they have a rat team dealing with it, uh, we have more turkeys, and the turkeys eat the same seeds, nuts, and insects that the rats do. So they compete for the foods, and we have less rats because because we have more turkeys. Many residents are, are convinced. Uh, cats are predators of rats, so if, as long as we have some cats and owls and uh, red-tailed hawks, you know, I've, I've seen a, a red-tailed hawk pick up a rat uh, right by my street. <laughs> Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, so I know that the, there's a natural predation there, and certainly we wouldn't want to poison them. Um, anyway, thank you. Thank you. Natalie Marks, followed by David Hazen. Hello. I am a resident of Eugene of 19 years and a current college student representing the Southwest Hills Neighborhood Association of Betty Taylor's Ward 2. 
I am presenting the resolution of the board of the Southwest Hills Neighborhood Association of Eugene, Sheena, regarding birds, urban wildlife, rodents, and stray and feral cats. The control of garbage and curbside food waste and public education and outreach are known to be effective tools in controlling urban rat populations. Wild turkeys and rats are known to be competitors for habitat and ground source foodstuffs, including seeds and insects, as previously mentioned. And whereas some Eugene neighborhoods have reported more rat sightings when turkey populations have diminished in the last five years and vice versa. At a city work session on February 28, 2018, the city of Eugene discussed the drafting of an ordinance which would ban Eugene residents from the feeding of wildlife and even feral and stray cats, possibly even in the absence of any property damage complaint. Many residents of Eugene and their private residences elect to use hanging feeders to feed songbirds and also may feed quail and doves at ground level or may feed squirrels and other wildlife in their yards. Therefore, the Board of the Southwest Hills Neighborhood Association urges that the City of Eugene undertake further investigation and undertake public education outreach regarding nuisance wildlife. And the Board also urges that any feeding ban on wildlife possibly impacting birds and stray or feral, feral cats not be enacted as an ordinance until such time as full impacts of, the, of such proposed measures can be more fur, fully investigated by relevant city authorities, including the Eugene Sustainability Commission. Thank you. As a resident and someone who's concerned about the native wildlife found in Eugene, Oregon, I and the Sheena Board hope you take this proposal into high consideration. Thank you. David Hazen, followed by Lori Huber. Hi, David uh, Hazen, uh, Betty Taylor's Ward 2, and I love Eugene. I'm not leaving. <laughs> I would like to remind uh, the council about the urgency of what I call internally displaced persons who would qualify for the UN's definition of refugee status if this were declared a war zone. And we're not Baltimore, we're not Chicago, but people are dying here and they're being traumatized by their homelessness. And this has long-term social and economic consequences that are unimaginable. Um, we do live in a war zone and we need to act with the kind of triage decision-making that such conditions require. That's my main point. Uh, we're learning that government-funded solutions, in fact, especially federal government uh, solutions, are difficult to obtain and slow to produce results. And now uh, what a local city can do is that I think would be most cost-effective, in addition to gathering information as you are doing from your various commissions and departments, and I want to particularly point out these documents that were produced by your one homelessness analyst in the manager's office, um, which could easily be expanded to a staff of 12 Reagan watches, I think. Um, and, I, and I know I have agreement on that. <laughs> um, there's, I mean, what an, a, a team of people could do look at the whole system of homelessness as a system and incorporate all kinds of information into recommendations for policy changes and designing um, organizational incentives and structures that would clear the pathways for what's already in existence, your grassroots organizations here like CSS, Square One, Nightingale, Egan Warming Center, CAHOOTS, Burrito Brigade, Occupy Medical, and of course, I want to mention the faith community. These things are already here. They just need an overview organizing body that says, let's get together and do it as a team. Let's have a goal and let's move the ball down the field. We all have different strategies, different, what do they call, uh, play play cards, whatever, 
But the goal, we know what the goal is. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lori Halber, followed by Jacob Fox. And if I stand? Okay. <clears throat> so, hi, my name is Lori Halber, and I am a resident of Emily Simple's Ward 1. And I'm here tonight as a representative of the Housing Committee of First Congregational Church. Um, and first, and I'm here to talk about housing, and I'd like to thank all of you for your commitment to trying to tackle the housing issue that David has mentioned and you've heard from many others over the past several months. So um, just a few things, and I, and I spoke at a prior council meeting about some of our code provisions and how those code provisions provide an obstacle, in many instances, an insurmountable obstacle for places of worship to put two or three, four or five Dwell, small dwellings on their property. And you know, these are dwellings that would house people who are housing insecure and are transitioning into a more stable, permanent housing situation. Um, and so, and I, and I think some of you are aware of our experience with First Congregational Church, and we've spent over almost a year now trying to just put two small units on our property that will house two families, and we would work with St. Vincent de Paul. They would provide the case management with the goal of that two-year period being for these families to be ready to move into long-term permanent housing. And this was something that actually was initi initiated by the Neighborhood Association, and, and they came to us making that request, and we thought, well, it makes perfect sense, and we have... 33 families in Edison School who are homeless or housing insecure. So what part can we play in that? So, but, uh, as some of you have probably heard, we, we haven't been able to find a way to do it. Thought it would fit under the overnight camping ordinance. No, I won't bore you with all the details, but no. Then we thought, well, could we do it as an SDU? But no. Owner occupancy prohibits that. And then not just owner occupancy, but there are limitation, other limitations, including the definition of SDUs in the code themselves, make it impossible. Um, and, and what we've learned through this process is not only a lot more about the code than we ever imagined, but we also learned that there are several other places of worship in Eugene that are very eager and have a desire to help make a difference and, and do something similar to what we're doing. We're, there are multiple models. I'll save that for another evening. But, um, but we, we want to help make it possible. So this isn't just about our church and what we want to do. This is about trying to make it possible for many churches. And I know at a prior council meeting, you heard from David Hazen. Um, oh, time's up. Thank you. Thank you. Jacob Fox? Followed by Dennis uh, Sandin. Great. I'm Jacob Fox. I'm the executive director of Homes for Good, 177 Day Island Road here in Eugene, 97401. I just want to speak briefly and provide some input on the Opportunity Zone um, opportunity that you'll discuss later in the meeting. Um, it's something that's new, and I think the City of Eugene staff and um, folks in the community like myself are trying to really understand the intricacies of it. But it, it does seem like um, it has some real potential to um, catalyze investment. Uh, and with the presentation that happened in the work session around the OB project and Riverfront, um, I just see it as a potential tool to help investment, especially in sort of what, what I would call middle-income housing. I'm not sure it's a tool for affordable housing providers, but I do want um, the City of Eugene to look closely at it. And I would also just compliment the City of Eugene because the staff have brought together community leaders over the last week in a short period of time, and it's been good to be at the table thinking about how the tool can be used. Thanks. Thank you. David San Dennis Sandin. Dennis, okay. Followed by Jim New. Uh, my name is Dennis Sando. I live in Eugene, and um, in Ward Seven. I'm going to set a context because 
some of my neighbors and I might be making a presentation that you think belongs somewhere else. Um, I live on uh, Fur and Lombard Lane, the entrance to Maury Jacob parking lot. It's a jurisdictional mess. Um, where I live, we have uh, the uh, Homes for Good jurisdictional body, having just uh, been in the process of selling three acres on the end of Lombard. We have Lane County that owns the right of way of Lombard. And we have uh, you, the permitting authority, on Lombard Lane. Uh, Lombard Lane is tiny, it's about 14 feet from my home. And with the, um, the sale that's in process right now, we'll have a 94 unit development um, going at the end of Lombard Lane, which we uh, predict will generate about 100, well, about 890 trips per day. We don't see uh, any way to avoid widening Lombard, and if we see that Lombard's widened, we'll lose property. Um, this is a very quaint neighborhood. When you go on vacation, you usually don't go to a strip mall, you go to quaint neighborhoods like ours. So what we have is a jurisdictional problem. The, uh, the development of the 94 unit apartment is it going to fit within Envision Eugene and your seven pillars? It's going to look like just the opposite. It's going to ruin the ambiance of our existing neighborhood that's country-like. It has homes for people with developmental disabilities through Section 8, homes that are serving seniors in two homes, and a tiny 24-home uh, neighborhood. So um, what you hear may sound like a planning um, uh, requirement that the neighbors are presenting to you, but it is a jurisdictional requirement that we are bringing to you. We are asking that if the sale of that property was given a notice to us neighbors, we could have done a much better job in line with Envision Eugene of developing that neighborhood in that three acre parcel. So unless we see collaboration between the three jurisdictions, we can't uh, see a community as a whole. And so uh, I want to leave you with good news. Oh, see, you don't get good news tonight, do you? <laughs> um, can I leave uh, my testimony and neighbors? Yes, Make absolutely. Sure Thank you. Jim New, followed by David Piccioni. <clears throat> Mayor and Council, my name is Jim New. I live in Ward 7. Um, two weeks ago at public testimony, I asked the Mayor and Council if there were quarterly reports concerning amending the transportation system plan to include greenhouse gas measures and assessments to proposed uh, transportation system plan projects. These reports were to start in June of 2017. Council Member Clark inquired as to his amendment as well. Have these quarterly reports been received by Council? as they have not been posted on the website for public viewing. <clears throat> on another note, the U of O Campus Planning Committee submitted its North Campus conditional use permit to the City of Eugene for approval to allow for installation of three artificial turf fields 200 feet from the Willamette River. Considering the toxicity of crumb rubber ground up tires that makes up the base of artificial turf, this proposed plan does not fit the location's environment. Every plan proposed by the university included artificial turf fields with no alternatives, and the Associate Vice President of Campus Planning said it would be a logical conclusion artificial turf will be used in this plan. Petroleum-based crumb rubber contains lead, a neurotoxin, cadmium, zinc, carbon black, and dibenzopyrenes, a known carcinogen. This surface becomes much hotter than natural turf, off gases toxics, is inhaled and ingested during use, and because of its hard base is more prone to injury and can lead to infection risks such as MRSA. The senior planner with campus planning stated the city will approve the permit by summer with public comment allowed after permit approval.
The university has been less than transparent in this procedure. Their permit was submitted to the city before a February 26 meeting with the Office of the Provost and Academic Affairs and staff and student opponents of the project. I understand public comment period is provided at the Planning Commission level and that this per permit process may not come before the Council. However, I urge Council to keep the University's North Campus plan on your radar and discourage artificial turf fields. A bank of sport field lights illuminating artificial turf fields may disrupt the ambiance of the city's downtown riverfront plan. Thank you very much. Thank you. David Piccioni, followed by Bruce Holland Rogers. I'm Dave Piccioni. I'm in Surrettes uh, District. I live in Eugene. Uh, I just want to read one of my uh, le letters to the editor about the uh, auditor. And uh, I just want to say as an introduction that I don't have any evidence, nor am I accusing of anybody of doing anything. I don't know if, if any, any bad things are going on with city government, but this is what I wrote. The title was given by Eugene Weekly. It's called Appointing Ourselves to Death. Would you willingly submit to an assessor or auditor regarding all of your proceedings if you were in any kind of public office? You'd have to be quite confident of, in your character to reply, when, reply in the affirmative. It would surely ease your dis discomfort if you yourself were the one who got to pick who this auditor was, wouldn't it? This way, under the table arrangements, backstabbing, non-cooperation, and other unethical and even illegal businesses could proceed unimpeded. Would it be in line with America's values to say, appoint a president? Political elections distance us from totalitarian systems such as monarchies, dictatorships, and the overthrow of democ democratically elected governments. Appointments are much more in line with them. Having those who think they are better than the rest of us make decisions for us as a group seems an earlier stage in human evolution. The group that wants to have Eugene citizens vote to pick an auditor got about 13,000 13, signatures. City officials and managers want to be those who appoint their own auditors. That is why they have lately been mobilizing towards this with a whopping 80 signatures collected online. What they want is obvious. Who wouldn't like to be one's own police, or at least be able to appoint those who police you? This seems rather rather obvious from the standpoint of those being watched. By what, but why would citizens, ordinary members of the public, share this, this desire? We should all work together to, and collaborate for a complete and perfect Eugene. So just because something is green, like AstroTurf is plastic with a green pigment, that doesn't mean that that's what we're talking about when we want more green stuff. And another thing I wanted to say about the trains, I don't live near the trains to, for them to bother me enough, but I think being a recovering alcoholic and drug addict, I think that if you fall asleep on the train and they run you over, that's your own fault and the whole people that live in that that area don't have to be subjected to this horrendous noise keeping them awake at all hours just because somebody might pass out in the middle of the of the the railroads thank you thank you uh, Bruce Holland Rogers followed by uh, Kailas Nedar Nedar Juna Hi, counselors uh, I'm Bruce Holland Rogers I'm a Eugene resident and I live in, in uh, uh, Ward 7. I want to thank my neighbor, Dennis, for providing the context, as he said, for my remarks, so it doesn't seem as if I uh, uh, intended to go to a planning meeting and ended up here instead. But I am wanting to uh, talk about the Lombard Apartments development. Like Dennis, I'm concerned that in the overlapping jurisdictions of city, county, and homes for good, we may end up with a housing development in my neighborhood that fails to serve the council's vision for housing development and for citizen engagement. I recognize the need for new housing in Eugene, and I'm not opposed to new housing, even uh, dense housing adjacent to my property. However, I'm opposed to this specific development plan because in den density it would be entirely out of proportion with the neighborhood that it would be expanding. Uh, it appears to be a development that is not considered how to preserve the character of the neighborhood that it's joining. 
More concretely, we don't have the current infra infrastructure on Fur Lane or Lombard Lane to provide access to so many housing units without improving those streets and also thereby changing the character of the neighborhood. I have additional traffic concerns. Turning east on Lombard Lane from southbound River Road already disrupts southbound traffic at times thanks to a turn lane that's shortened by an improved crosswalk and northbound traffic that's entering the turn lane to access business on the west side of River Road. I don't think such a dense development should be undertaken without considering its impact on the intersection of River Road and Fur Lane and the likely need for a, a traffic light at that location. So I'm hoping that the council can make sure that jurisdictional overlap doesn't result in an unintended outcome in this development. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Wayne, oh, let's see, nope. Kyla Snedarjuna, followed by Wayne Martin. Thank you, my name is Kyla Snedarjuna. I am on Ward 7, Claire Surrett's Ward. Um, I have been uh, living at 394 Lombard Lane for the past 16 years. It's a home that I've shared with three generations of my family, uh, ranging from a child who was born to that home to his grandparents, my parents, who just months ago passed away in their late 90s. Our house is on the portion of a Lombard that used to be gravel, but now is mostly dirt. There are lots of potholes, and when it rains, lots of puddles. And never mind that because the house, built in several stages since 1998, faces on a beautiful meadow that is enjoyed by everyone in our neighborhood. People walking to the bike path, often with their dogs, people picking blackberries in the summer, and when fall comes, walnuts from the five or six very tall trees that grow there. Every year the field is full of Queen Anne's lace. It's a floodplain. It's a floodplain, but we've taken our chances because of all the benefits to our health and spirits and also the opportunity to regularly chat with neighbors as they stroll by. My nephew, elementary school age, would walk with his mother from our Lombard Lane home to the school bus in the Maury Jacobs parking lot at the end of Fur Lane. Even in the current situation, everyone walking or driving on Lombard Lane needs to be careful of the unregulated intersection at Briar Lane, Briarcliff Lane as well as the intersection at Fur Lane. Please take into consideration any significant increase of traffic along Lombard Lane will certainly represent a hazard not only to school bus children, but also to the children at the Parkside Community Preschool, as well as to the many people, the many people who walk or bike to and from Maury Jacobs Park along Fur Lane. Finally, there is my personal worry that the value of my home will significantly re decrease, that a new, wider, heavily trafficked road will entail the loss of at least part of my property. There's a mature Italian plum tree near the border of my property. I might lose it. And is it possible? Probably not, but I don't know for sure that because of the need for a new street or streets, my house could be lost altogether through eminent domain. I've heard from friends that years back when the city or county was contemplating a bridge for vehicular traffic across the Willamette and right through Maury Jacobs Park, property seizure by eminent domain was a very real threat to our neighborhood. Thank God that didn't happen. Our city would have lost a much cherished corner of itself. Thanks for your patience. Thank you. Wayne Martin, followed by Michael Gannon. Good evening, I'd like to address you, Madam Mayor, Manager Reese, and other staff that you have with you and the members of the Eugene City Council on a matter that we don't often directly address in this chamber. It's a matter that is completely integral to the subject of homelessness. Not only is the matter mentioned rarely in relation to homelessness, it's likewise rarely ever mentioned in relationship to other critical subjects, such as medical care, legal care, crime reduction, business, finance, transportation, parks, and firecrackers. You name it. The subject I'm referring to is suffering. I'm feeling led to speak to that subject. In 2014, after the closing of a homeless camp at Broadway and Hilliard, about 50 people had nowhere to sleep. In that frightening time for them, I decided to allow two of them to set up home in my garage. 
I was then living in the 1200 block of Washington. Over the course of the next eight months, I was able to get one of them, we'll call him Tom, an apartment with the help of shelter care and one of their great case managers. Tom's still housed after three years. The other one was not so fortunate. We'll call him Bill. Bill had had a lot of bad luck in his 46 years. He had serious drug and alcohol use. He was born into a family in, with too little money, too little education, no resourceful parenting skills, no books, and too much violence. He failed at school. He joined the army, went to boot camp, and had no background in adult living skills. The violence in his family was regularly inducing emotional outbursts and then physical fighting. After seven months, he was dishonorably discharged. For four years, my wife and I allowed him, have allowed him to, to live sh have shelter in our garage. Multiple efforts to break with amphetamines have been successful and then failed. It's been heartbreaking for us, but far, far more so for him. In the part, past four years, he's been imprisoned twice, then released. In the past four years, his mental health has declined to the point where there is no longer any connection between the thoughts that he produces. Nowadays, he knocks on our door multiple times a day, but cannot have a thought stream. Years of meth use, unrelenting mental illness, and unrelenting bad luck as a child have left him broken. And there's the bad luck that he brought on himself. For my six years as a volunteer with multiple endeavors serving the unhoused in Eugene, I've been, I am able to tell you now there are hundreds of people like Bill here in Springfield and Eugene. This suffering, three more sentences, may I? This suffering is unbearable and each year it gets worse. They are weakened by years of hard living, severe lack of sleep, assault, stealing and being stolen from, being banned from LTD. And all the while their coping skills are diminishing and so is their mental care. Thank you. Thank you. One last thing. Could it be time for us to restructure the way we think about the people we say we are serving? You can. You know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Gannon, followed by Hazel Tolinsky. Good evening, councilors and mayor. Thanks for your public service in Eugene. I'm happy to be here. I'm gonna to try to talk to you about, maybe it's just hard for me to talk to you about it, but I think it might be hard for you to think about it also. And I'm only bringing it to your attention because it doesn't seem like you're thinking about it. And that's disturbing. And that is the um, process that we're undergoing right now to find a new police chief. I've uh, tried to be as clever as I can as an activist in the community to uh, follow with that process and make uh, uh, a contribution to finding a good police chief. And. I don't see that the input that I've had in the couple of meetings that I attended to find out what the community thought, they didn't make it forward in the process. I applied to be an interviewer and I didn't make it. So I'm left with um, a very short time in which to approach these candidates. And I think that the city has not done its job and presenting the candidates. So I'm wondering if uh, it wouldn't be appropriate, I'm here tonight to talk about what some people would say prematurely, but I think that we have a, uh, a March 23rd uh, date on which to choose a new chief, and I think the process is seriously flawed and needs to be extended. We need to get more candidates. I've repeatedly at the meetings suggested that we should solicit applications from female candidates. And along with that, uh, assuming that we would look at other um, 
minority candidates also. I don't see any of those people having, if they applied, made it. And I think that you, most of, the, it seems like there's a lot of reluctance to have an auditor that is um, unencumbered by his relationship to the council and the city staff to look at how these processes are undertaken. We, um, I don't think we've seen the questions that the community has suggested we ask for people. And I think that we are sophisticated enough to know that when we are out like a football coach looking for the very best, you have to put that out there. So we need to indicate that we're looking for minority candidates. We need to look, we need to note that we're looking for women and make them feel comfortable in the process knowing that if they endeavor, they would be looked at carefully. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hazel Talinsky, followed by uh, John Brund, Brand, John Brund. Hi, my name is Hazel Tylinski, um, and I am here, um, I'm a student at the University of Oregon, Ward 3, um, and I'm here as a member of Osberg, Oregon Student Public Interest Research Group. Um, just to kind of update you guys on what we're working on and what we have been working on in this past year, um, we work on different campaigns every term. Again, we're a student-funded, student-run nonprofit on campus. Um, we work on, we're working on a hunger and homelessness campaign um, this term. Earlier this term, we had a Greek life food drive um, and raised um, over 1,500 um, pounds of food. We do a lot of work with White Bird and um, Lane County, um, uh, Food for Lane County. Um, and another campaign we're working on is our textbooks campaign, where we're working on um, to promote open textbooks, which are peer reviewed and little to no cost online, um, as well as trying to get rid of access codes in our national textbook campaign. Um, those make college less affordable and having um, resources like this makes it more affordable. Um, another thing we're working on, our lead campaign actually, is our 100% renewable energy campaign. Um, this term we were able to join Renew Oregon in a coalition of other groups um, in the lobby day where over 400 people attended, which was awesome. Um, and on campus we are starting to um, work towards getting U of O to move towards 100% renewable energy. We do a lot of petition drives around that. Um, and then another campaign we're working on is our Defend Our Rivers campaign. Um, we are worried about the LNG pipeline um, that's gonna go through Coos Bay. It would, go, it would affect over 400 rivers and streams in Oregon. Um, and we think that our rivers and streams are part of what makes Oregon so beautiful. Um, and we've, between our UBO chapter and the Southern Oregon chapter um, have collect th collected thousands of petitions from students in support of um, stopping this pipeline. So it's really an issue that the community feels is a problem. Um, and then another campaign that we have is our democracy campaign, the one that I'm helping out with. Um, and in this campaign, we're working on balancing out money in Oregon. Um, this last year, up until the end of this February session, we're doing a lot of um, work to uh, promote the Small Donor Empowerment Program initiative that was going through the session. Um, and then this next term and um, moving on in the democracy campaign, we're gonna try to look at ranked choice voting also. Um, so that, which would kind of encourage a more diverse ballot um, and let people vote for people they really feel um, represent them rather than the person that they think is going to win without the fear of um, the person who's most has the most seniority or the wealthiest network behind them. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, John Brund. Pronounced Bruna. Bruna. It's an old Czechoslovakian name. Oh, very good. No wonder I didn't get it right. Sorry about that. And he'll be followed by uh, Zach Maholland. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for giving me the opportunity to talk to you this evening. Um, as you know, uh, you've already heard the uh, statements from other neighbors in the neighborhood down there on uh, Lombard Avenue and Briarcliff about the concerns of the proposed development. 
So I have more questions than um, statements concerning it. And one is I would be curious uh, about the changing from a 500 to a 100 year flood event. Who was in that process? Was it just the county and the city or was the uh, Department of Environment and Quality or the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which is generally those who consider uh, floodplains and uh, uh, wetlands for wildlife. Um, another one is um, as far as the city and the county working with the developer, has there been any discussion about uh, mitigation to the floodplain? How are they going to, to deal with it? Uh, as many talked about the uh, impact to Lombard Lane as far as uh, the roads. Uh, I'm not sure what the minimum right of way width is, but uh, it seems to me like the roads would have to be upgraded to maybe cement or blacktop with sidewalks. Uh, who is going to be responsible for uh, maybe new sewer lines, power to the development? Is this something that the landowners on Lemward Lane is responsible for? Or is this something that the county and city is willing to come in and make those upgrades? Uh, the other one is, you've heard this, there's going to be a 94 unit development and possibly anywhere from 600 to 890 additional trips along the roads. You know, um, the intersection there with River Road is always is already busy and so how are you going to address the issue where 600 more cars are going to be able to get off fur and onto River Road? That's uh, going to be, to me, a, a huge con congestion problem as it already is. And um, I've heard once that uh, FEMA is approving now the development of floodplains and is this something that FEMA is going to come in and assist the developer in this issue or how is this working those are you know not only county or city but they're also federal dollars that might be involved and is this going to be something that is going to help the developer there, there you know to me there's a lot of issues here that hasn't as far as i know been addressed as far as um impact statements uh looking at uh development costs not only to the developer and the people along Lombard Lane and the other roads. Thank you very much. Thank you. Zach Mulholland and oh and you're the last one. Zach? Hello Mayor, Council, thank you for uh, the opportunity to speak tonight. <clears throat> Uh, my name is Zach Mulholland, resident of Ward 1, uh, here to talk to you about the eWeb Riverfront Master Plan. Uh, first, I did want to thank you for signing on to the work poll uh, for EV Ready Home Policy and the Home Energy Score Policy. I uh, really appreciate that that's going to be moving forward and getting scheduled for a work session. Uh, on the eWeb Riverfront Master Plan, I want to thank uh, many of you for meeting with me and as well as many of our counselors that are, are not here for meeting with me over the previous weeks to discuss the proposals uh, that were uh, presented to Council uh, in late January. Uh, the concept uh, from the de developer. <clears throat> uh, I think uh, something that I picked up from our, our meetings, I think there is kind of an agreement uh, among counselors that there should be a uh, public process where there's public education and a chance for the public to comment on uh, the concept and changes from the previous Riverfront Master Plan uh, early enough in the process where uh, changes to that plan can be reviewed by the public and potential changes can be made and there can be plan refinement based upon public comment. Uh, so I guess I would just ask that uh, you ask the city manager publicly, uh, what is the plan? Uh, is there an opportunity for the public to get educated and comment early enough that things aren't so well baked that it's really hard to go back and make changes? Uh, so before uh, major permitting begins or before a contract is signed that, uh, or ready to sign that we uh, have that uh, public uh, opportunity for comment. So. Uh, I appreciate your time and uh, thanks so much for your uh, interest in this issue. Thank you. Thank you. And that closes the public forum. Are there counselors who wish to comment? Councillor Syrett, take it away. Thanks. Um, thanks everyone who came to speak. I actually have questions um, about the concerns we heard about the Lombard Street um, 
proposal and, and I got an email today from a constituent raising some of the same concerns. It was the first time I'd heard about it. So does, does anyone know if that is a planning um, commission process yet or is this still at a point where this has not actually come to the city for consideration? Uh, you know, I don't know. I'm not familiar with the project either, and so I'll have to find out. Okay, so if, I, if you could get me more information, I, it, it could be that right now it's a sales situation between two private parties and, and that the city's not involved in the conversation yet, and, and in, which, in which case, if that is the case, then there is still a lot of process to go through, um, even if the parties who own the land sell it to other parties who have development ideas. That doesn't mean those are necessarily going to um, happen in exactly the way they're being talked about right now. So, um, and if they do get to that point, then that probably would be a planning commission process that a lot of these conferences would need to be directed to. There need to be traffic studies and wetland studies and a lot of other work before anyone could actually develop on the property. I was looking at my screen while many of you were speaking because I was looking at the plot of land that you were speaking about um, during your public comment. Um, so thank you uh, for those who came to speak. And then um, to our last speaker on the wetland, uh, excuse me, on the eWeb uh, project, um, and I know we raised this before, um, but just wondering, City Manager, um, what your thoughts are about getting uh, additional public input on the what are now proposed changes to the master plan concept and, and what thoughts you've had about that and what plans we might have for some additional public input on that. Uh, I'll get back to you on more specific kinds of things. There are a couple of places where uh, they would naturally come back for the council and the public will be engaged in. So for example, if uh, any of the actual codes are uh, recommended to be changed, of course, that would come back to the council. Uh, any deal points with a development agreement would have to be approved by the council, and so that would also be a, a portion, a part of that. Uh, and then uh, I'd have to check a little bit more on uh, other spots where the uh, uh, community would necessarily be weighing in on the overall concept, and I can get back to you on that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I, that'd be important. Thanks. Any other comments? No? Okay. Thank you all very much. That closes that portion of the meeting. And we will now go on. We will skip the consent calendar because we can't vote on that. And we are ready to go on to a discussion of opportunity zones. Thank you, Mayor. And Ann Fife will get us started with that. Good evening, Mayor and Councilors. I'm Ann Fifield in the Community Development Division, and I'm here this evening to provide Council with information about Opportunity Zones. And I have a very small PowerPoint that she's bringing up. Opportunity Zones are a new program created by the 2017 Federal Tax Reform Legislation. The aim of the program is to encourage investment in certain qualifying low-income areas. Each state's governor has been asked to nominate areas in their state to receive the Opportunity Zone designation. Through Business Oregon, the state has asked local communities to nominate areas that the community would like to receive the Opportunity Zone designation. They are a very new tax incentive. The timeline to understand them and nominate areas for designation has been very short. Tonight, I'll provide an overview of the program and how it's being implemented. Um, that's all right. And so the... Yeah. You've got oh, you've got it there, and there's an outline of what I'm going over, the very brief outline of the topics I'll cover. And so the first is, what is an opportunity zone? It is a designated census tract that creates a tax incentive for investments in small business and real estate development. To be eligible to be designated, a census tract has to meet certain low-income criteria. It must have an individual poverty rate of at least 20% and a median family income no greater than 80% of the median family income. 
Opportunity zones offer favorable income tax treatment. It is not a property tax exemption. It affects federal income tax by lowering the tax paid on capital gains. So for example, if someone sells a property or a stock and the income Yeah, I can hear you. Folks at home can't hear them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so if someone sells a property or a stock and the income from the sale is subject to the capital gains tax, they can reduce their tax burden by investing that income into an opportunity zone. The intent of the program is to channel and oh, there we go, and real estate and real estate development in distressed communities. So the program is being implemented by the U.S. Department of Treasury and the IRS. The Treasury Department has directed each state's governor to nominate the state's census tracts to become an opportunity zone. And do you want to flip it to the next slide? I don't even have a clicker for it. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Um, uh, and so the Treasury Department has directed each state's governor to nominate the state's census tracts to become an opportunity zone. This approach was intended to help ensure that local needs and opportunities are being met. Up to 25% of qualifying census tracts in a state can be designated as an opportunity zone. And of Oregon's 366 eligible census tracts, the state may nominate no more than 86 census tracts. Business Oregon is providing the governor with data and analysis to help in the designation process, and they've asked for input from local governments and the general public. The input process is very open. Anyone can submit a form to nominate a census tract. It has been a very quick process. The tax reform legislation was enacted on December 22nd. It was 90 days for governors to submit their, their census tracts, which is March 21st, which is next Wednesday. The Treasury Department issued its guidelines just on February 8th. Our local input is due to the state on March 14th, which is this Wednesday. It's a shorter timeline than is ideal. So the expected impact from Opportunity Zones will the private, well, the private investment will come into opportunity zones through so-called opportunity funds, which will be a new class of investment vehicles that specialize in pooling private investment and deploying that capital into opportunity zones. The guidelines for the opportunity funds are still being developed by the Treasury Department and the IRS and have not yet been released. We have limited knowledge about how the opportunity funds will be deployed, but unlike many other tax incentive programs, this doesn't have requirements for jobs or specific types of investments. The opportunity, the opportunity Zone program incentivizes taxpayers to invest in an opportunity zone by lowering the tax burden for investment income. It won't guarantee new investment in the opportunity zones, but it does make the area more attractive for new investment. And so in Eugene, there are 20 eligible tracks. The highlighted tracks are what's eligible in our community. Based on a straight proportion of Oregon's 86 eligible tracks, Eugene's share is five tracks. And so staff have identified five tracks that align with existing economic development planning and policy documents. The five tracks, oh, and here's some, just to help you orientate yourself on a census tract map, which is not the easiest map to read. The red, map, the red census tracts are those that we've identified as the, as those that align with our existing policies. The one in the downtown, track 3900, downtown is a focus of strategic planning and redevelopment. As shown in the mapping value project, downtown's dense development pattern supports the community's fiscal health. The opportunity zone incentive could shift new development projects from not quite penciling out to penciling out. The Bethel neighborhood, which covers three census tracts, the Bethel Economic Development Task Team completed the Building a Better Bethel Plan in 2015, and one of the identified tools to advance that plan was to create incentive opportunities. The Bethel area covers three census tracts, and the Opportunity Zone could help bring about redevelopment along the Highway 99 corridor and to support business development in the area. The 
Tract 3700, the far eastern one, includes the riverfront redevelopment site and Franklin Boulevard, and it's part of the River Districts area. The area is planned for significant redevelopment, including the former eWeb site and the Plan Night campus. Our intent tonight is to share our rationale with you and to hear your feedback on what we've recommended. The next image shows the same map but with neighborhood boundaries on it just to help orientate you to where the tracks are and how they align with other existing parts of town. So we're ready. That's, that's the presentation. We're ready for feedback. <laughs> It's in private businesses and real estate development. By using the opportunity fund, the pooled, pooled funds from private investors go into the opportunity fund and that can be used to invest in any private business and to the degree we know any real estate development in an opportunity zone. That's all we know at this point. Exactly. Multifamily apartment complex. It's very different from tax credits like low income housing tax credits where those are specifically designed to get a, a social service product out of the ground. This doesn't have any other, it, it, it is only designed for private development. Mm -hmm. That's not defined. things we're deferring out of our tax base in order to incentivize. Is that a correct characterization? That's correct. There's no, no impact to our local tax revenue. But would we be vetting the projects locally? Who would be deciding what was a qualified project, the federal government? We don't know the answer to that. It'll come out in the guidelines on the opportunity funds. Okay. Um, well, uh, with that limited understanding of, uh, and I don't blame you for that, um, and understanding how the census tracts work, you know, I I, uh, so I like the inclusion of the three Bethel zones, and I, I know if Councillor Evans was here, he'd be um, saying that as well, and we did, you know, have the Better in Bethel um, work done, so I, I see how that aligns with... Um, you know, plans and projects. Um, or is the idea to submit all five of these nominations? Yes. So I guess, um, you know, then I look at like, what about train song? And you know, f there's four corners, uh, which might get captured in the map, but maybe not. And as opposed to the area around Franklin and the University of Oregon. So I guess for me, I feel like in downtown and some of these other places, we have tools available to us to use. And right now, we don't have any tools in Bethel. And we don't really have any tools in Train Song unless we made them ourselves. And so I guess I would, although I understand the aligning with planning processes that are already underway, you know, even... Um, River Road, Santa Clara, you know, we've got a planning process there, but that hasn't been identified as a potential recommendation. So I, I, I'm not saying these are the wrong choices. I'm just saying in terms of thinking about where we already have local capacity to maybe do some of the projects in our plans versus where we don't might be another criteria to look at which of the, these five choices we make. Mm -hmm. Councilor Pryor. Thank you. Um, I wanted to um, get a little more clarification on the criteria for from the feds for selecting census tracts. Um, is it primarily income based? Are there other factors that design, that determine which census tracts get picked? It was they identified is there's the eligible tracts are based on the poverty rate and the right. family income rate, and based on. Uh, five-year average of ACS census uh, survey, uh, the American Community Survey data. How you, and then the legislation allows 25% of all tracts 
to become a designated opportunity zone. And it's up to the governors to decide which tracks will be nominated to the federal government. But it's primarily uh, built on income and poverty. Yes. Yeah. There were, they're not, 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 not like ethnic, socioeconomic, it was basically income and poverty. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that then leads to the question, is this tool in, in your, based on limited interpretation of the federal rules, is this tool primarily intended to benefit residential or business commercial interests? It's intended to, vent, to encourage investments in, of all types in the opportunity zones. Okay, so it could be it could be building homes. It could be it could be building businesses. It could be it could be used for any purpose that enhances the economic viability of that census tract. Correct. Okay, um, I'm trying to hone in on why one tract might be more advantageous than another, and I know that part of our economic development interests are for. I would assume the tracks that you chose because they're ones that in previous plans we've identified as areas of economic development opportunity. Um, the, the question I had in addition to train song, which we've had identified for a long time, it's part of the enterprise zone uh, that we talked about, so it does have some value there. Um, but from the residential standpoint, uh, we've also talked about the Whitaker uh, as an area where we want to be as thoughtful as we can as that area improves and develops what kind of additional um, federal or local influence we could use to prevent it from becoming overly expensive? Is there some sort of a leverage you could have to make the area develop but not become unreasonably expensive? That's why I asked about residential versus commercial. I don't know how those factors are considered in here. I don't have a problem with the five areas that you've designated. I can see exactly why those five areas would be chosen. Um, I'm thinking that all of us up here could pick five based on what's the important criteria for us. So I don't know the degree to which I want to second guess the staff. Um, it's unfortunate that this is moving so quickly and that we have to submit our nominations so fast and so soon that there's not a lot of time for us to kind of say, well, have we, you know, what, what are the pros and cons of this one? What are the pros and cons of that one? Um, we're all going to feel real rushed, you as well as us, um, in terms of which five we pick. Um, so. I guess what I'm saying is, gee, it would have been great if we could have all had more time, but I guess it's, you know, we have to submit something, right? <laughs> or not. Or not. <laughs> but if you don't submit, you're not even in the running. I don't know. I think it's the governor's choice. We don't have any direction from Business Oregon or the governor's office on what happens if we don't submit. Okay. I'm just thinking if there's an opportunity to get some sort of an incentive from the government and we pass it by because we couldn't make up our minds, that would also not be a good outcome. So I'm back to fast, right or cheap, pick any two. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Councilor Clark. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. This sounds like a wonderful idea. I like it. It's an opportunity to use folks who, who might have an, an incentive because of this to invest in areas that they might not otherwise in order to get a better return. Um, and at the same time, it provides an opportunity for those areas to see economic um, gains that they might not have seen with specific private focus before. So I'm left asking the question, are the red areas that you have with those particular five census blocks, are those um, the areas with the current, current lowest net property values? And here's why I'm asking that. It's it's private money, federally incentivized, and doesn't cost us anything. Why don't we leverage this to see the greatest amount of property value increase, thus affecting our city tax base the best? So in other words, are these the, <clears throat> the lowest valued uh, and largest blocks of property that would see the highest amount of net increase in value with this designation? We didn't do that kind of calculation, but um, I think it's a little bit implicit in how we thought about things. I think particularly in the downtown where any development is very likely to be dense development and you'd get a lot of bang for your buck out of new development. 
I agree with you on that one. My question, and don't misunderstand me, I think that the, the university's investments and everything that they're doing around the, the, the new campus are maybe some of the most important things our community will see for a long time. It's state land. There's, there's no increase in property value that will translate to property tax increases for the city of Eugene from U of O land. So from my perspective, I'd rather see Train Song and up and down 99 get more private investment and see it increase in value so that the property taxes in those areas would be a great deal higher. But what I would most like to see is a calculation that says these are the biggest chunks of land that have the lowest per, you know, per square foot value that, if incentivized in this way, produce the greatest possibility for, for, evaluate, for valuation increase that thus translates to higher amounts of revenue to the city of Eugene per square foot. I don't, I, I mean, I'm sure you could build the spreadsheet to do that. I just, yeah, I mean, you get what I'm saying. That's that's what I would have the greatest amount of interest in. So that, that would be my criteria. Councilor Ye. Yeah, thank you. I'm trying to figure this out. Maybe I'm a little slower. But um, so what is the benefit of adding another incentive to an area like downtown where we already have incentives rather than in, like, I don't know, Train Song or River Road or... Like, wh why did you pick that as their number one priority? In the downtown, in the last maybe three or four years, we've seen a few projects come forward for plan development, and ultimately they fell apart because they didn't pencil out. And, and uh, what this does is it lowers the cost of it to... It lowers the risk to investors by because it has this extra advantage that has nothing to do with the project. They get a tax benefit that's outside of the project simply by investing in the project. It makes this area more attractive to develop in. And so in the downtown where things are close but not quite able to pencil out, this program could lower the cost of equity coming into projects. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Um, but a lot of these other areas haven't gotten any of attention, and the downtown has gotten a lot of attention. I mean, it has an urban renewal, I understand, for like 50 years. And so I guess I'm wondering, is there at some point some kind of equity issue here where we're putting a lot of incentives into the U of O area and the downtown and not so much in some of these other communities? Did you want to respond? I just want to clarify and listen to the conversation. Maybe it's more of a philosophical we're, question. But. We're not limited to five. Ah. We, we started at five because that's kind of our proportionate share. Um, so you could I just, you could add a census tracker two, and meaning we would nominate seven instead of five. So I just want to make it clear that we're not limited to five if you wanted to pick and choose and swap out. So sorry. But chances are, if they're going to give us them, they're going to start with okay. number one and then go to, yeah, I mean, they're going to go in the order that we're asking for them, assuming that those are our priorities. So I assume then we would not necessarily get all seven, so we're still getting downtown first and the other communities that have had less attention last, if yeah. at all. The ranked priority would, we do have to submit a ranked priority. Okay. I guess so... I guess the, we don't, it feels like we just, I know you have a question, I just want to jump in here and make sure I get this. So e even if we add seven, w I mean, you're going to submit this in two days, so we would just be shooting from the hip <laughs> <laughs> to suggest anything any, anything <laughs> other than <laughs> what you have put forward. But I, So I guess I... I just want to say that I sort of resonate with the comments of my colleagues on the council that I feel like I understand you're thinking about downtown and that does make sense. I feel a little more ambivalent about around the Franklin Boulevard area just because we're the you know, I, I hear what Councilor Clark is saying. It feels like there's a lot of investment opportunity there. How much do we need to incentivize that? And I also would love to see Train Song included in this. So um, I'm with the other folks. I'd like to sort of really see that kicking in. The other piece I just want to ask you about, it. 
I'm thinking about Jacob Fox's testimony earlier where he suggested this may is maybe not the best tool for this sort of subsidized affordable housing, but really a better tool for the sort of missing middle workforce housing that we're looking at. So I guess that's the other piece when we think about where do we need that housing or want that housing. I'm assuming that factored into some of your thinking. <clears throat> you could incentivize building that, which often doesn't pencil out because the rents aren't high enough. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And and we had feedback from the affordable housing providers with concern that the program could have unintended consequences and cause displacement of existing low-income housing. Okay. And, and that we've heard that concern, I think, primarily in the Whitaker. And that's, that is one of the reasons that the Whitaker census tract and the one with Trainsong wasn't included. Okay. okay. Councillor Syrett. Yeah, so uh, uh, I appreciate Denny letting us know we're not limited to five. I appreciate that piece of information because that's what I was thinking about um, why I didn't call out Whitaker is because I know there's still a great deal of sensitivity there about displacement. And um, I can imagine an incentive, a, a program of this kind having the potential for displacement depending on how it played out. Um, but I still think... Um, Capturing the Four Corners area uh, is yep. is important, and I don't think it's captured in the three on the west, and that we'd have to include 4,200 census track in order to cover that. And it would seem to me a shame to incentivize development on one side of Highway 99 and not be able to incentivize development on the other side of Highway 99, which is potentially how I read this map. <laughs> and so actually, if you, that census tract 4300 extends to the east side of Highway 99. Does it? Yeah. It's, okay. It, it, it's, we were lucky in that way. Mm. And, and if you, and so you see the bottom of 4300 is 11th and Beltline, and just above the number 4300 is Roosevelt Boulevard. No. Oh, I see what you're saying. And so Four Corners is right there. Is right there. Okay. All right, so that that because so I'm definitely sensitive about the you know affordable housing that we have in Trainsong and Whitaker and and wary of um, attracting certain types of development there, but I think the Four Corners area of our community deserves some attention and could warrant attention of this kind and benefit from it. So as long as that's in part of this consideration, then then I'm happy with that decision. With, with that selection. Okay. Councillor Pryor and then Councillor Yeh. Yeah, yeah um, thank you. This has been actually really helpful. And um, I, I understand the, the arguments about downtown. So I, I think those are legitimate because downtown is something we do want to give extra effort to, but not necessarily at the expense of other areas, but we recognize it's an important area that we want to incentivize. Um, I also can see why you would leave um, the Whitaker out, um, because if the tool is not used properly, I see how it could be a problem. But if the tool is used properly, it could actually be a benefit. So it's really in how the tool is used. Um, so I, in, a, in the short time, you may have to just go without it. But I do see 4,200, though, since a, a lot of that includes an area that is poor, underdeveloped, could really use some some serious improvement. Um, I'm less concerned about the displacement aspect there, and I think part of why we included it in the enterprise zone uh, is because we recognize the, that area's particular need um, for some real dramatic uh, improvement. And plus, I think if you included it in our um, application, I think it would send a signal that we're very conscious of Train Song as being one of the poorest, mm -hmm. most poverty. Um, imposed areas in the city. And to leave it out kind of sends the signal that, yeah, we understand what your program does, but we left out 4200, which is one of the poorest areas in Eugene. Um, and so I think including it might actually be um, advantageous from a couple of dis different reasons. So I, I would say you might want to consider adding 4200. Okay. Councillor Yeh. Yeah, I just want to clarify, this doesn't just incentivize housing, it's businesses and housing, right? Businesses and real estate development. Businesses and real estate development. And so it could could very well apply to any sort of redevelopment of commercial activity along Highway 99. Right. Okay. Thank you. Can I just get a little clarity? So, for example, we could add train song because we could submit more than 
five. Uh, I want or the. 4,200 census. I want to make sure that does include a portion of Whitaker, right? And so I just want to make sure that we're okay with that. <laughs> can't I can't go out and poll everybody. Yeah, but, but I just uh, want to. Just being aware. Yeah. So, okay. So we can, we can add 4,200 and submit six, for example, into the back to the state and see how that works. Uh, I mean, one positive is is uh, when the development comes forward, they still have to go through the regular land use permitting process. So it's not as if they can just build whatever they want wherever right. they want just because they happen to be in the opportunity zone. zone. So there is that still that has to occur. So. Yeah. Yeah, this just opens the door, basically. Uh, yeah, it potentially provides additional right. investment right. into an area that would be helpful to have additional investment. So that's, that's, a, that's the positive part about it, actually. Yeah. Councilor Yeh, did you have your question? Are we going to talk about this again on Wednesday when you bring like the final thing? Is that what's happening here? What we're going to do is submit. Okay. Yeah, so we <laughs> You're just going to send it. It's just going to go. Yeah, we actually okay. have to submit. Yeah. That's the okay, challenge. well, just so. in case anyone cares, I think putting the downtown as number one is a bad idea, and we should yeah. switch some of those yeah, numbers agree. around. I mean, I think the downtown's great. You know, they have some great stuff downtown, but they've been getting a lot of attention, and I think Train Song and Bethel, I think they deserve I think we'll, that it's their we'll time. Look, we'll relook to private Okay, based I would on appreciate that. A little, yeah. little yeah. bit of where you add value. Okay. This would be Mike's yeah. thing. Yeah, <laughs> I, I support that. I support that too. So, perfect. All right, are we are we finished? Thank you all very much. Thank you for that report. It's uh, kind of wild how yeah. short the timeline is. Huh. Well, so with shelter care, we did.